failure of these agencies to adequately police the oil and gas industry have led to numerous incidents of the emission of toxic pollutants into the air, which were entirely preventable. The oversight failures that have caused them have led to a crisis of confidence among the public that the state government is capable of ensuring the health and safety of the public. This crisis of confidence benefits no one, not the public, not mineral lessees, and not even the oil and gas industry itself. Ultimately, for the public to regain confidence in the oil and gas drilling practices are safe, Texas state government must step up to the plate and demonstrate that the job can be done within our state's borders. Regarding the Railroad Commission, the agency simply does not have the personnel to adequately oversee all of Texas's oil and gas infrastructure. Overall, in the state, there is an uh, inspector to wells ratio of about 1 to over 4,586. 4, that is simply not enough inspectors possibly to do, do the job of overseeing Texas' fast oil and gas well infrastructure. Texas must hire more inspectors to have an adequate number of inspectors to oversee this infrastructure. Regarding the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, the agency must do a better job of monitoring air emissions and reporting those results in a timely fashion to Texas elected officials and the general public. To highlight just one incident, it is simply unacceptable that air test results of toxic chemicals in the Barnett Shale were not given to elected officials such as Cong Congressman Michael Burgess and State Senator Wendy Davis until four months after the tests were conducted. The TCEQ must be more transparent, accountable, and accessible to all Texans. An unfortunate consequence underlying the purpose of our presence here today is that Texas failing to do an adequate job on oil and gas reg regulation obfuscates the idea that Texas natural gas needs to be an integral part of Texas's energy future. An even bigger failure of Texas leaders in to adequately regulate the oil and gas industry is a stubborn insistence to continue to rely heavily on coal to provide for Texas's energy needs. The state is missing a critical and much needed opportunity to have Texas natural gas supplant coal as an energy source for the state. There's nothing the EPA is updating these rules can do to change the fact that electric generation for natural gas produces about 50% less carbon, 80% less nitrogen oxide, 100% less sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, and mercury than coal does. And there's nothing the EPA is updating its air regulations can do about the reality that every time a train comes into Texas loaded up with Wyoming coal, it brings tons of pollution to the state, and that train leaves with cash filled for Wyoming coal producers, does nothing to benefit Texas gas producers, and does nothing to create natural gas severance taxes for Texas. It is little wonder why the communities from Abilene to Corpus Christi to Bay City are fight fighting the permitting of new coal and pet coke plants in their backyards. Does Texas need to do a much better job of ensuring that natural gas drilling are safe, and reducing point source pollution from drilling, processing, and transport of natural gas? Absolutely. But at the same time, the state should place a moratorium on coal fired power generation and replace old, dirty coal plants with plants run on Texas to produce natural gas and explore the expanded government use of electric and natural gas powered vehicles. In short, Texas's leaders must find a way to efficiently regulate the oil and gas industry, ensure that drilling is done safely, and do so in a way which makes natural gas an integral part of Texas's energy future. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify before you.
They are the leading developers of the shale plays that are transforming the U.S. clean energy landscape and allowing communities across the country to advance economically and embrace cleaner energy and cleaner air. <coughs> Texas is the largest producer, but it's also the largest consumer of natural gas today in the United States. You can see on the left the economic and environmental needs here in Texas. On the right, you can see how favorably natural gas offers itself as a solution, economically, environmentally, and from an energy security standpoint. Specifically on the economic side, there are 2.8 million American jobs supported by the natural gas community. <coughs> Nearly half of them are right here in Texas. And the community benefits and the tax revenues are very substantial, as you can see from this slide. Much of this opportunity, as Bruce mentioned, is being driven by shale gas. This is the natural gas locked deep beneath the Earth's surface in dense geological formations. Here you see the locations of the major shale plays. Many of them are right here in Region 6. We don't yet know the upper limits of this domestic abundance, but it is from the established scientific consensus from MIT to CIRA to EIA and others that we have enough natural gas to power our nation for generations to come. It did start in Texas with the Barnett Shale. The Barnett Shale supplies 7% of the United States natural gas. So there is a lot to learn right here in Texas. I know you will hear today from Dr. Ed Ireland of the Barnett Shale Energy Education Council and other local stakeholders. One of the most important takeaways is that we can develop this resource to the benefit of our economy and energy security, and we can do so in a very safe and responsible way. Here is why it is so important that we do so. These are the EPA non-attainment areas for ground level ozone. Obviously, there are other categories as well, but this is one glimpse of the clean air challenges we face as a country. And natural gas is a critical component of how we address this challenge. As you can see from this slide, the clean air benefits of natural gas for transportation as a vehicle fuel are very significant. Natural gas has far fewer emissions, as you can see, over traditional gasoline. I mentioned AT&T as an example since they are based here in Texas, and they remind us that it is not just governmental entities that are making positive change, but leading corporate citizens as well, like AT&T, who are contributing to cleaner air and greater energy security. The most substantial opportunity lies with the use of natural gas for power generation, as you've already heard from our other speaker. The debate in Washington is focused primarily on carbon. With respect to carbon, natural gas is twice as clean as coal when used to generate electricity. It also has just 20% of the NOx emissions that contribute to ground level ozone. It has virtually zero emissions for sulfur dioxide, zero emissions from particulate matter and mercury. Natural gas is also greatly underutilized as a fuel source for power generation. It makes up 41% of our generating capacity in the United States, more than any other energy source, including coal. Yet it is actually used to only generate uh, the electricity in the United States about 23% of the time. Natural gas is also complements renewables, offering clean, reliable power when the sun sets or the wind dies down. So there is tremendous potential. And that's why you're seeing momentum gathering around the country for natural gas. Community after community is choosing this clean energy source. They are seeing the favorable environmental impact and the economics are making sense too particularly thanks to the market stability that comes with the domestic abundance coming out of all of these shale plays across the United States. I know you have a lot to consider today. I thank you for coming to Texas to hear from the community here, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the economics and the clean air benefits of this versatile domestic American resource. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leslie? Thank you. I didn't do any slides because I'm glad you kind of look at me today. Right. Nobody looks at me since I've turned 50, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, as 
I knew a lot of people had stolen my thunder, so this would be very, very short. Um, I'm you might want to still pull that just a little bit oh, I'm sorry, I tend to get louder and faster okay. as I get used to uh, well, I'm with the Railroad Commission. I'm with the Oil and Gas Division. I'm the Chief Geologist. Um, I've been there for 27 years. The Railroad Commission is one of the oldest uh, regulatory agencies in the nation, and it's the oldest one in Texas. Um, we have, as our name indicates, we started out regulating railroads. We no longer regulate the railroad, railroads, but we do regulate the oil and natural gas industry, uh, pipeline transportation, natural gas and hazardous liquid pipeline, pipeline industry. Natural gas utilities, LP gas industry, alternative fuels, uh, coal surface mining, and uranium expo exploration operations. Uh, we're responsible for ensuring the effective use of the state's energy resources through the regulation of almost all phases of oil and gas EMP uh, activities, including uh, the drilling of the well, uh, all the way through the gathering, the gas processing, the transportation, or the tran transmission of the process gas compression all the way through to distribution. Uh, so we're, we are very interested in this process that you, you are engaging in. Um, we are currently, currently oversee over 10,000 business enterprises operating over 279,000 active producing oil and gas wells in the state. Um, our oil and gas division performed over 128,000 inspections, and yes, we agree that we could do more inspections with more people. Where our commission oversees the most extensive state network of pipelines in the nation uh, that are required to gather, transport, and deliver valuable oil and natural gas resources, we have the responsibility to ensure that that pipeline system is designed, constructed, operated, and maintained safely. About a sixth of the total pipeline mileage in the nation is, in, is located in the state of Texas. In all of these activities, we coordinate with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and with the Environmental Protection Agency, among other agencies. We have a memorandum of understanding between the Garden Commission and the TCEQ delineating our respective areas of jurisdiction and responsibility, which has been in place since 1982. Two agencies continue to coordinate and to cooperate on air issues and all other areas of concern, and will continue to remain engaged to participate in relevant meetings and to monitor the overall situation. Indeed, the two agencies hope this month to finalize the fourth update to our MOU. Although the Railroad Commission's direct role in regulating air emissions is relatively small when compared to that of TCQ and the EPA, the work we do and the activities we regulate can impact air emissions. And the work that you do and that TCQ does can impact the activities that we regulate. In the 1990s, the Railroad Commission began an award-winning waste minimization program for which EPA provided funding. IOGCC, the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, which has been mentioned earlier, and many oil and gas producing states have used this waste minimization program as a model. Uh, included in that program were recommendations for minimizing air emissions. However, EPA ended the funding for this program, and when the funding ended, so did the active program, although we still include all of the research that we did on our website and make that information available. Um, earlier this year, the Railroad Commission tried to step up our efforts to make information relating to reductions and air emissions more available to our operators, uh, to the operators that we regulate. Also, last year, um, I chaired a multi-stakeholder effort um, on the part of uh, an incorporation for a four oh three, whatever it is, a nonprofit organization called Stronger which is the State Review of Oil and Natural Gas Environmental Regulations. Um, it's a multi-stakeholder group, <clears throat> uh, independent board that's made up of 